Welcome to VCF Reno's podcast. Join us on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. for our RE series as we explore together what it means to rethink church. Stay tuned for Pastor David's latest message, Victory Christian Fellowship. Hope together, serve together, love together. 24 of us uh, spent yesterday and 20 of us spent the evening Friday just gathering together and talking about um, just vision and strengths, weaknesses, all of these things about VCF because what we're doing is, is we're coming out of 2019 and going into 2020 and for a church plant the second year is easily the most critical year of the church plant. It's, you know, you, you, we've had a great start. We've had some decent, uh, decent growth and we've seen God do a lot of amazing things. But that corner turn is probably the most important corner turn. So a lot of hearts and minds came together and just started sharing life together. We played games. One thing I did learn is that we have a very practical group of leaders. If you give them something practically to do or a practical problem to solve, not only does it get solved, but man, they get fired up for it. And uh, Friday night we did that. And then we did a theoretical challenge. We had a theory of how to solve a problem. And uh, 75% of them were falling asleep. So a lot of them don't want to talk about what we could do. They want to just do it. So that's a good mix. Can I just tell you that if you have a group of thinkers and planners and no doers, you're going to spend a lot of time doing a lot of thinking and talking and note taking. But the idea that we have a lot of practical doers in this church that can apply plan and theory is just such an amazing gift and such an amazing blessing that God has given us in this early stage of being a church. And I was just uplifted by it. We didn't accomplish everything that we wanted to accomplish, but um, we certainly accomplished a lot of things. What the most important thing that we are, need to bring to the rest of the church and, and the people that weren't able to be there is how that we can pray moving into 2020. We need to pray that God can come, will come and do the things that we can't. Can I just tell you this truth today that we are not capable of doing the plan that God has given us. And the moment that we start to think that we are and the moment that we start to execute it like it's our plan and we're doing this is the moment that we're taking God out of the equation. So as we pray moving into 2020, as we pray for the leaders that, that uh, sacrificed their family days and their weekends to come sit in cramped condos and talk about stuff like zombie apocalypses. Hey, you changed it. It was no longer a zombie apocalypse. Hey. Everybody changed it. Everybody created their own narrative, but yeah. Post-apocalyptic world, how would you survive? We move away from that, we move into what are we doing as a church? And how can we step aside while still pushing forward? Well, there's only one answer to that. We need to pray that God engulfs us and empowers us with his power to do his plan and his work. So before we start this morning, we just bow your heads and pray with me as we, I, I want to start a focused prayer moment between now and the end where we're praying for what God is going to do and that God comes and does what he wants. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to just be in your presence this morning. And Lord, we welcome you into this place to fill it so full that there's no room for us anymore. Lord, engulf us so much that we are unflinchingly sure of what you desire for us, where you need us to go, who you need us to talk to, how you need us to talk to them. Lord, we submit that to you and we just pray that your power overwhelms us and that we're able to fulfill the needs of this community, that we're able to fulfill the needs that you have set out before us so that we can expand and grow and strengthen your kingdom here on earth. Lord, I thank you for that truth. I thank you for, for providing BCF with the people who are committed and engaged and sold out to make that truth possible. We thank you in your son's name. Amen. So be in prayer for BCF and our leadership as we get ready to turn a very, very important corner. This week we're going to be talking about uh, resurrect. And I'm going to make it a point to get to the point really quickly. It's funny, as I was preparing this, I thought of Christmas. Most people would think of Easter, right? But I thought of Christmas. Um, and I thought about, I love Christmas. 
I love every part of it. And I know that the world, a lot of people will say that the world has hijacked Christmas and turned it into something completely unobtainable. And there's truth to that. The way that, that Christmas is promoted starting on November 1st every year now, and it's getting earlier and earlier, right? I think um, Walmart put their, uh, started putting their decorations out with their Halloween decorations. So it's getting earlier and earlier now where the world wants us to focus on the holiday that's coming. And they want us to focus on all of the things that are so much fun. Listen, trees are great. Uh, parties are great. The food is great. The cookie trays, the treat trays, they are better than great. Okay? The partying, all of it. The family dynamic. The, just the feeling of the house when you wake up on Christmas morning. No matter what your feeling is about Christmas or what your family or friend situation is, Christmas morning feels different than every other day. That's all good stuff. Can we just acknowledge and accept the fact that all that stuff is good stuff? But the reason that I thought of it when I was thinking of resurrect is because it's just a shadow of the substance. And when we, when we try to embrace a shadow, we find that it is not physical. It's not obtainable. It doesn't bring you any comfort. It won't hug you back. It's got no substance. But I don't want to preach a, a, or even tell a story that says that, that it's bad. Just because it's a shadow of the substance doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. Listen, enjoy them. Party. Look, Jesus' very first miracle in Scripture is to make sure a party didn't stop. They ran out of wine, so he made more because the party was lit. <laughs> and it needed to stay that way. It's okay to enjoy and celebrate and love and live and all of those things. Getting and receiving presents, depending on who you are. Everybody likes a good present, even if it sucks. <laughs> but a shadow can't comfort you. When we put our focus in the shadow, and this is the most important thing, when we put our focus on the shadow of the substance, what we set ourselves up for is what sociologists would call the Christmas blues. Or psychologists would call post-holiday depression syndrome. I like to just say, you feel a little sad and let down when it's all over. After everything is done, after all the parties, after all of the, the Christmas morning breakfast and the gift opening and the dinner, you just kind of have that, huh. I spent two months being surrounded by this. And that's it. When we put our hope in the substance instead of the shadow, we will be left with a shadow hangover. You don't have to drink a drop of alcohol and you'll still feel like you have a hangover. So why does that matter? It matters because it's representative of the fact that the world is not as God designed it. Uh, on the first couple of pages of scripture, the world enters into a state of brokenness. And, and this is a universal agreement. No matter what you believe, whether you are a, a hostile atheist or you are a, a monk, and everything in between, and every religion in between, and every belief system in between, and every culture around the world that doesn't have any idea what's going on in America or England or any of those places, they can agree universally that the world is broken. And the truth is, is that it's broken because of our sin. There's no other component. The world is broken because of sin. And that's where resurrection comes into play, right? Resurrection is, is this wonderful word, and when we hear it, we like to talk about it, we like to talk about Easter and Jesus defeating death. And that is the best message in the world. But if we just focus on the fact that Jesus defeated death literally, practically, physically, then we're missing the bigger point. Why did he need to do that? I think so often when we share the gospel with people, and the gospel is quite simply Jesus lived a perfect life, he was executed on a cross, he came back to life and ascended to heaven. That's the, that's the Reader's Digest version of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the truth of it. Right? But if we just tell that story and not say why he did these things, why did God have to send his son? And for those of us that are parents, this is a big deal. 
And sometimes I think that we forget what a big deal is because it's God. It's okay, God's big enough, powerful enough, and knows all the things that he's trying to teach us so he could cope with that really well. Do not underestimate the pain that was inflicted on God the Creator by sending his son down to die. Why? It's because the world was broken with sin. And people will define it different ways, but it doesn't matter, it's all the same. And throughout Scripture, starting in Genesis 3, we start to see the promise that God made once the world was broken... God knew that he wasn't just going to forfeit it, even though he almost did. He decided that it needed to be fixed. And the promise starts to appear in Genesis chapter 3, that there's going to be a reconciling moment where that brokenness is fixed. He says, I will take care of this. And then you can see it throughout the line of Abraham. You can see it through the prophets. You can see it through the line of David. There's a promise that is to be made that through the line of David, a Savior will be born. In Jewish culture, it's the Messiah. All of this translates to one real simple reason. So why would God need to fix something if he could just fix it automatically? Right? He could just wipe Adam and Eve off and put two more down and start over. Video game style. Right? Reset. Regenerate. But what, what, what happened in that moment was if that's what God wanted to do and keep doing it until he got it right, can I just say that none of us would be in here the, right now? And those of us that are in here who have given their heart to Christ and given their life to what it means to be a follower of Christ, we wouldn't need that. This is the power of God's promise starting in Genesis chapter 3 and ending in Jesus. We admit that the world is broken from sin, but we also acknowledge that God has a plan to fix it. And that plan was manifested in Jesus Christ. We have to understand that why why this happened, why God had to sacrifice his own son, is because the hope of repairing a broken world is more powerful than all of the sin in the broken world. The hope that God will fix the brokenness is the substance that we have to be embracing because the shadow will give us nothing. The shadow that is cast because we need hope will bring us nothing. All right. We see God pushing forward this promise to solve it, and we see it manifested in the life of Christ But then we also see it manifested in how can what happened to Jesus Christ reconcile us? He was mocked. He was beaten. Every possible imaginable horror was laid upon his body. I have said this before. The the people, the historical people who helped create the Passion of the Christ couldn't believe how far they went, but we'll tell you they went about as half a far as far as they could have. It, why? Because God made it so. God promised that it would happen. And, and here's the beautiful thing about resurrection. So we like to end arguments as Christians that we're losing, or debates, or discussions, whatever. If you're trying to win your point, you're having a subtle argument. Even if it's a friendly debate, a friendly debate is a nice way of saying an argument that's not going to end a friendship, okay, about resurrection. And and all, all too often, we play a trump card that we think makes us the winner, and that is, well, it's faith and you can't argue faith. And there's truth to that, because it's by faith, through that grace, that we believe in that, that, our, that, that God has erased us and made us new and given us this opportunity to not dwell and live and embrace shadows. But there's a practical side that doesn't get discussed enough. There is a famous historian that was living at the time of Jesus' life. His name is Josephus. And he witnessed all of this. And he documented it. And he almost lost his life because he documented the truth. There, he came before the Sanhedrin to answer for his crimes of spreading blasphemy. He said, I'm not spreading blasphemy. I'm just telling you what I saw. So many people saw Jesus Christ 
walking, living, breathing, encountering others after he resurrected. It, it wasn't just those that, that landed at the tomb, and it wasn't just Peter and the, the apostles up in the room, and it wasn't just Paul on the road to Damascus. It wasn't just the people who wrote the Bible. We're going to learn today that Paul brings this, this physical, practical side to it. He quotes Josephus. 1 Corinthians 15, which is where we're going to be today, quotes Josephus twice. This is, this is an apostle of Jesus Christ who's quoting a G Jewish scholar who almost lost his life for even saying those things. For those of you who rely on reason more than faith, can I just tell you, great, because here it is. Jesus lived after he died, physically. And it wasn't just the people who wrote the Bible that saw him. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us 500 people saw him. 500 people. I say this a lot. But if we take our hope and we throw it at the shadow instead of the substance. And let me just give you an example of some shadows that we throw it at instead of the substance. If you put all of your hope and your faith and your goals into your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or a loved one, a friend, brother, mother, father, it doesn't matter. If you put your hope into those things, you're in for a rough time because they're just as broken as you are. That's the shadow of the substance. So let's put our hope into the substance. If you have your Bible, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's uh, start with verse 3. So starting with verse 3, um, I want you to just key in on the, these first couple of words. For what I received, I passed on to you, as of first importance. You understand that, that what, the way that Paul is wording it to these people is, let me share this story with you and see if it changes your life. No, what he's saying is, is, I received the grace and the goodness and the forgiveness of what I'm about to tell you, and I want you to receive it also. This word received is not, I want to teach you something. It's, I want you to have something. I want you to have something that is substantive. I want you to have something that you can hold on to that is actually going to make a difference in everything that happens in your life after this. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That is critical because Christ dying for our sins is not just a thing that happened. It would not have been the sacrifice that brought salvation to the world had God not said it was going to happen at creation. That song that we sang today where it talks about if, if the world experiences you and believes that, and if you believe that this is, then so will I. If creation speaks, so will I. That's what Paul's saying right here. Creation spoke, and now it's being fulfilled. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Cephas is Peter, by the way. It's just his biblical name. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of, of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. He appeared to me abnormally born. He appeared to me to somebody who was born broken. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet no, I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. This is what we preach. We are giving you the substance so you can get out of the shadows. And all of us, uniform, we're not teaching different things from different people. We are all teaching the same truth that this happened. And Paul starts this whole passage with reason, not faith. The guy who has brought us the words that by faith, through grace, we are saved. He abandons that and goes to reason. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, 
How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him in fact. The dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. So he's kind of repeating himself. Listen, and this is important. This is all useless if you don't believe that Christ came back from the dead. If Christ died and didn't come back, it's nothing. He died. No matter what the apostles or anybody else after wants to say, that he was the son of God and lived a perfect life and died for our sins, that check bounced without resurrection. But instead, the check cleared, and we are all welcomed into this space of reconciliation. If only this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We're going to stop right there for a second. Don't do this to me. There we go. You guys have no idea the week I've had with technology. So, ultimately, when we talk about the gospel, we talk about resurrection. It focuses in on this one thing. And this is the thing that I want to take you to, to have you take out of the room today. To take out to lunch with you. To have be at your dinner table. To be in your small group. To be in your car when you drive to work every day this week. I want this to be with you. This is what God has given us today. Forgiveness. The whole point and the whole purpose of God's, God's solution is so that we can be reconciled with him. And we can't be reconciled if we're living a life that is dead to sin. And there are all kinds of different thoughts on forgiveness. There are, if you talk to people about forgiveness, you'll get one of three camps. You'll get the camp that believes that through this important historical gospel moment, we are redeemed. And then you'll get this group of people that doesn't think they need forgiveness. That somehow, some way, they are the next incarnation of the perfect soul that is going to die for us one day. Can I, can I tell you that person hasn't been born and won't be born? But there is, a, there is a camp out there that believes they don't need forgiveness. But then there's the camp that's probably the most important camp, and that's the people who don't think they deserve it. That whatever they did in their life was so disgusting and so vile that they can in no way be a recipient of forgiveness for it. If he was resurrected, and it's documented outside of Scripture, which is what is called corroboration, and scholars use it before they publish material, then there has to be a reason for it. And the reason is, is it doesn't matter how vile or disgusting or terrible that you, whatever it is that you don't think you can be forgiven for, is encompassed in that moment. Jesus, when he broke into time, when the gospel became a real thing, a viable, substantive thing, when it became real, he broke into time, and not just at that time, he broke into here today. He broke into wherever you were yesterday and where you're going to be tomorrow. Jesus is there. The truth of the resurrection is today. This isn't some historical holiday that we celebrate once a year. It's what we encompass our lives in. Because no matter the wake of destruction that your life has behind it, it doesn't matter because Jesus broke into time and said, I forgive you. I want to know you. I want to be with you. And I want you to know me. And I want you to be reconciled to me as I intended and designed the world to be. Resurrection... The physical resurrection of Jesus Christ is critical to what we believe. But what's critical to your life is understanding that it was also a representation of what happens in your life. When you repent and turn away and accept the grace of the cross, 
when we repent and turn away and accept the grace of the cross, our life is essentially resurrected from the death of sin. Resurrection is true and real. It's the substance, not the shadow. If you came here and you said, I believe this, God, and I'm, I, I want to walk with you, I want to walk in your light and grace, and then you go this way, but here, right here, what you have is all of the garbage that you don't think you deserve forgiveness for, and you bring it with you, it's going to be a trash heap that piles up, piles up, piles up, and eventually you can't drag it anymore, and that's just going to be where you live. No matter what it was. We are resurrected from our death and sin, no matter what it was. So, I'm going to end on a darker note. <laughs> I, want to, I want to tell you a truth, and I, I kind of talked about it last week, and, and bear with me. I, I'm ending on a darker note, but I'm ending with hope. Can I tell you the truth? Uh, later in, in, in 2 Corinthians and throughout Paul's teaching, he makes sure that we know how fragile we are. He, he wants us to know exactly how fragile we are. And what I gather from, from studying Paul so extensively for the past couple of years is that Paul wants us to know that you're easy to kill. We are all in this room incredibly fragile. A car ride, one cell going rogue in your body. Right? An icy sidewalk. We are eggs. Eggs. We, sh we, we should be treated the way we treat eggs, right? Check them, make sure they're not fragile, take them home, carry them like they're, you know, Fabergé eggs. We treat eggs the way that they are because they're fragile. We are fragile. But God doesn't want us to live in that. He doesn't want us to live in this worrying about how fragile we are. I'm not, tell I'm not giving you permission to quit exercising or break your diet. Those things are good stewardship. But what I'm doing is I'm telling you to please live your life in the hope that is found in the substance of the gospel. And the hope that is found in the substance of the gospel has a bow around it, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which affords the resurrection of our life that is dead in sin. There's hope in that. Not fear, not worry, hope. So I want us to lean on that hope. As we go into the holiday period and we start to take our focus off of the things that are substantive and we start to focus on things that are shadowy, enjoy those shadows, but don't let go of the substance. Don't let go of the truth that allows you to have the freedom to truly enjoy the substance and the shadows together. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, what a blessing and an honor it is to just be here together and be in, in your presence. And Lord, I just pray that, that we leave this place today and that everywhere we go and everything that we do is filled with the hope that is found in the substance of your Son who lived a perfect life, who died a terrible death, and who defeated that death by resurrecting three days later, and who now sits at your right hand praying for us, praying for us to embrace the hope, to embrace the substance. We thank you for that prayer today. My prayer today, Lord, is that every person in here embrace that same hope. In your son's name, amen. Thanks for listening. We hope that you'll join us on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to know more about us, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at VCF Reno or online at vcfreno.org.